from the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. Yes, it's Tarzan, brought to you by CBS Radio, where America listens most. But before we begin tonight's story, remember that danger can lurk in your home. Keep danger away by keeping medicines and sharp implements away from the reach of children, and by keeping rugs anchored so grown-ups won't slip. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time. Transcribed from the immortal pen of Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan, the bronze white son of the jungle. And now in the very words of Mr. Burroughs, the story of Two in the Bush. many days, Tarzan had been following the wretchedly ill Congo buffalo, hoping to aid the trembling beast. But each time he drew close, it shied away, and staggered on, plunging ever northward toward the dense bush country beyond remote Gerahadi. Suddenly, the pitifully suffering creature lurched into a wide clearing, and Tarzan was amazed to behold a collection of small buildings, dozens of animal-filled cages, and an immense aviary containing hundreds of captive birds. As the now hemorrhaging buffalo tottered toward the largest of the buildings, a man emerged, elderly but unbent, and possessed of the most powerful-looking hands Tarzan had ever seen. Go away, you. Humans are not welcome here. I may prove even less welcome before I leave, for the sight of caged animals and birds has aroused my curiosity and my anger. Oh, keep quiet. Can't you see this animal needs all my attention? Here, help me hold him down while I give him a shot from this parade. You, you had the syringe in your hand when you came out of the building. Of course I did. I've been expecting this fellow for days. Now then. Oh, cut it out, you honorary critter. That little needle didn't hurt you. Now get into this cage here. Go on. What disease does the creature suffer from? Anthrax. Almost always fatal. Uh, lucky I had the serum handy and that patient arrived before... The final convulsive deliriums began. How did you happen to expect his arrival? Congo Buffalo seldom wander this far north. His mate arrived a week ago when she first contracted anthrax. And I was positive he'd follow, even if he didn't catch the disease. Congo Buffaloes are always very loyal to their mates. Too bad humans ain't more like animals. I share your feelings on that score. I cannot imagine an animal confining people within cages. You, uh, you obviously saved the life of that buffalo, and yet I'm at a loss to know why, if you intend to hold him captive. Sometimes it's necessary to put bars on a hospital window to restrain the patient until he's cured. That doesn't make a penitentiary out of the hospital. I haven't any more time to waste, jungle man, but you can continue your cross-examination while I make a round of my other patients, if you like. All of the animals and birds here are your patients, doctor? I'm not a doctor. My name's Neil Mortensen. You may call me by my first or my last name, but do not call me a doctor. Very well, Mr. Mortensen. Oh, more birds in here. This is an isolation ward for members of the parrot family who have been stricken with psittacosis. Parrot oh, fever. Well, there's a law saying that birds infected with psittacosis must be destroyed. I'm quite aware of that but I refuse to destroy any of my birds or beasts. I came to this remote sanctuary in the mountains to escape man-made laws, and I shall never permit those laws to follow me here. Halfway around the world, two other men were in a room full of tropical birds, only this room was in a warehouse of an American metropolis. The birds were in crude wooden crates, and the men sprawled in huge leather chairs that occupied an aisle between two of the endless banks of piled crates. A radio rested on an overturned box between the men. Hey, stop fussing with that radio crate. I want to hear the race results. Beyond in a couple of minutes, Ross. And not Ross. Rossignol. 
Ross, New York. It is French for the nightingale. Yeah, you already told me that a thousand times, but it's hard to say. You gotta have a bird's name. Why don't you call yourself Sparrow? Suit you better. And why did you not take the name of Gorilla when you changed your name? Don't get so smart. This piece got me without any wise crack. Say, you want I should start getting the clothes ready for the truck? And now the final race results. I have already told you to get into the road, but no further. Not out onto the loading platform. On the loading platform. And throughout the U.S., government health department agents today began a careful inspection of all pet shops and wholesale outlets of tropical birds as an epidemic of psittacosis or parrot fever began making serious inroads into the nation's health. At first believed to be a wave of typhoid fever, the disease was correctly identified late yesterday, and health department officials claim that by... Hey, what was the idea of turning it off? I didn't hear the race. Oh, I get it. That's what's wrong with them birds you had me put in the back room. All right, so that's what's wrong with them. Now, listen to me, Craig. Get this through your head. It is against the law to import parrots, parakeets, cockatoos, or any of the other birds we handle here. Mm. But even as it is, we cannot supply our customers. Our contact in Africa has proven very unreliable lately, and we may even have to go there ourselves if we can't fill our orders. But you must tell no one. You understand? Yeah, sure. I'm no dummy. Hey. Sounds like Sammy spotted somebody suspicious coming in. Great. Quick. Take those birds in the back room down to the furnace room. Destroy them quickly. And leave Pierre Rossignol to cope with the government health department agent or whoever the suspicious looking one is. <laughs> I have met the law before. And I have always managed to survive. <laughs> only to the furnace room, Monsieur Turnbull. Surely the health department does not require of its agents that they inspect heating system. I think I'll have a look, just in case. Uh, well, we were just about to join you in the furnace room, my friend. Uh, Mr. Craig, this is Mr. Turnbull of the government health department. <laughs> yeah? Glad to meet you. Everything is all right with the fire, Mr. Craig? Huh? Oh, sure, sure. Burning like a million bucks. It might be interesting to see how a million dollars burn. <laughs> it is your pleasure to inspect the boiler. You are, of course, most welcome. I will... Ah, no, you... never mind. If there were anything suspicious down there, you wouldn't be so obliging. As you wish, monsieur. There's something mighty fishy about your operation, Ross and all. I admit I haven't been able to find anything here. But I'm going to keep my eye on you... <laughs> The cremation of the obviously infected birds had crystallized Rossinol's determination to go in quest of a tremendous supply of new ones himself. And he'd already decided upon the coast of French West Africa as the jumping-off place for his hunting expedition. By midnight, he had made arrangements to charter a private vessel, one with a hold large enough to accommodate thousands of birds. On the other side of the globe, it was mid-morning... Carson had just completed accompanying Niels Mortensen on his customary morning round of patients. The buffaloes look fully recovered to me. They won't be back to normal for weeks, but I'll know it when the time comes. You saw that uh, buff-colored bird in the cage with him? The buffalo bird? Yes, I noticed him over in the corner searching the ground for a stray insect. And yet it prefers to feed on ticks, which it finds on the backs of buffaloes. Yes, I've often seen them doing that. Much as the crocodile bird picks parasites from between the teeth of crocodiles. Exactly, and they seem to have an uncanny ability to avoid contaminated animals. When the buffalo bird returns to its mission in life, I'll set the buffaloes free. You see, my small feathered friend is 
Well, really not a patient here. He's a sort of laboratory assistant. You you haven't shown me your laboratory yet. I was just about to. That's why I was heading this way. Ah, here we are. Oh, this is an amazing place, Mr. Mortensen. A fully equipped laboratory hidden in a jungle mountain. A uh, good many doctors would be proud of such a workshop. All right, so I was a doctor once. Struggling for years to win the confidence of people who judge me by my brusque manner and my huge, ungainly hands instead of my brain. By the time they finally came to me, I wanted none of them. You've decided to devote your skill to animals. In preference to people, yes. They didn't mind my lack of bedside manner, and my large hands were an asset. But I found that people weren't interested in the health of their pets. They wanted horses who could run faster, parrots who could talk more, dogs who could win blue ribbons to be framed and hung on the wall. Mr. Mortensen, on your wall, that, that feather. Oh, yes, yes. I, uh, I found it when I first came to the mountains, high up near the summit. But that must be six feet long. It's almost impossible to imagine the size of the bird it came from. Yes, I, I thought it was interesting. Uh, that's why I brought it back. It, uh, it recalled the oft-told stories about the giant rock. Rock? I've never seen a bird of that name in the jungle. Nor has anyone else ever seen one anywhere. But men have woven legends about them for centuries. Marco Polo spoke of a rock. The Arabian Nights made mention of them, and... One was supposed to have swooped down and carried off Sinbad the sailor in its huge talons. It seems incredible that a bird could pick up a man, but that feather... The legends claim that uh, rocks often made off with elephants to feed their young. Surprising that as a man of science you didn't try to track down this amazing bird once you'd found its feather. Well, uh, if I found one, uh, people might learn of it. Uh, ambitious men would vie to be the first to take a rock back to civilization... And greedy hordes would trample down what I've built up here. No, thank you, Tarzan. Your hatred of mankind is not natural, Mr. Mortensen, but it is understandable. If your sanctuary is threatened with invasion while I'm here, you shall have my unqualified help. <laughs> they tell about in all them stories. <laughs> I have an even more interesting story, my friend. It concerns two men who returned to America with a shipload of gray African parrots. Other city scenes with great commercial value, blooms from the beauteous, egret, and rare species of birds that will be worth a fortune. I told you all them long words and all this talk about birds is getting me sick. <sighs> Perhaps you'd best complete the packing of the nets so you can carry them easily. With my muscles, I could lug a blacksmith's anvil through the jungle. But I can't figure these nets. A mile wide and made with twine stronger than steel. What are you planning on capturing? Flying elephants? My contact in the mountain country north of where we will land will undoubtedly be most helpful to us. But... There are stupid ones who hold the ridiculous laws protecting birds as something sacred. If they attempt to halt my efforts, we may need our nets to ensnare some very uh, strange birds. As the weeks passed, Tarzan remained with the enigmatic Niels Mortensen and the suspicions with which the jungle lord had viewed his host rapidly dispelled as he watched the man's powerful hand subdue a feverish panther one moment and delicately pluck a thorn from the sensitive mouth of a tiny flying squirrel the next. With that incredible instinct known only to the denizens of the wildwood, sick and wounded animals made their way from almost every portion of the Congo to the uncharted sanctuary in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> 
But there's still one thing I don't understand, Mr. Mortensen. You free the animals when they recover, but you never open the cages of the birds. No. Not as long as lovebirds and cockatoos and the like are fashionable in civilization. You see, those born in captivity command much smaller prices than those taken wild. And recently, some were even stolen from the isolation ward here to be shipped to distant ports. By whom? By a young man I was training to be the world's finest veterinarian, an assistant I had here by the name of Clark. You discharged him? He, uh, he disappeared. I, I don't know where he went. Well, certainly, you must have some idea where he went. Well, back to work. Now, here's an ambulance case. An aggress. Badly injured. Yes, this is the season of the year when they grow long black plumes called aigrettes, more popularly known as ospreys by milliners and dressmakers. You think someone deliberately injured this bird in an attempt to secure its plumage? I'm positive of it. Well, come on. We better see if there's anything we can do for this one. Mortensen, he, he couldn't have flown far in this condition. The, the fiends who wounded him must be comparatively near. Or perhaps we could find him. I'm staying right here to look after my sick children, Tarzan. To find anyone in this dense bush country is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, Tarzan, I may need your help. Where are you going? In search of a needle. It'll be a wonder if the porters manage to get all them crates into the holes. Yes, we did well even without Clark. But I would like just a few more. Uh, Climb a little higher. Spread the net more, Cray. That is right. Just a few more parrots now. Suppose I catch something from one of them sea-looking ones. The vaccine will protect us both. We have nothing to fear. Provided you don't count me or my gun. What? Kerndon, U.S. Health Department, remember? Yes, but... But you couldn't have come here after me. A health department agent, eh? It isn't conceivable, now you... Now tell that trained chimp of yours to climb down from that tree and let's get headed back towards civilization. I never argue with a man who has a gun in his hand. Uh, Craig, come down. But first, drop the net. We are heading for... Craig, what are you... Perfect thing, Craig. Get this net off me, you fools. You may be able to get away with killing birds. I'll die too, boy. Perfect, Craig. Look, you guys, I left word where I was going. If anything happens to me... You did not have to hit him, my friend. He'll never escape from that net. I better start gathering up the things. Yes. Yes, we shall sacrifice this net and move on to another location. Uh, Craig, where did you get that? This big feather? Yes. Back in a rocky gulch just north of here? Uh, when? Yesterday, when you was busy paying off the porters. It's sure big, but why all the fuss? Look at it. The width of the columns, the length of the main shaft. Craig. Uh, if we can find the bird it came from, we can be rich, rich and famous. The most famous ornithological discoverers of the age. Uh, take another drink of water, Mr. Kernan. Uh, try to recall what they said before they left you here. Something... Something about a feather they had. The height of the tree over there. Uh, must have been part of my delirium. I, too, have seen such a feather. If only I could be sure that it lured them in the right direction. But when they left here, north. He said they were going north. Toward the summit where Mortensen found his feather. Mr. Kernan, I'm taking you someplace where you can receive treatment, and I shall go after Craig and Rossignol. No, Tarzan. I travel thousands of miles on a mere hunch. I won't be cheated out of going after him now. Not if I have to crawl to the top of this mountain. I'm getting dizzy way up here. Why don't we climb down from these rocks? We got one of them, ain't we? Keep climbing, please. This one may not live. It is only a baby who fell from the nest. Some baby. It must weigh over a hundred pounds. Uh, put it down here, Craig. It is injured. 
In that nest among the bushes ahead, there must be other young or perhaps a clutch of eggs about to hatch. You ain't looked down. Nothing but sharp crags as far as the eye can see. They're almost there. That's the nest ahead. Yeah. Look, like a magpie's nest. Only a hundred times as big. Two young ones. Beautiful specimens. Say, could you carry one under your arm? Perhaps I could help you with... Ah! Rosalia! Look, big one. The size of airplanes coming at us. It's an ant. I could have sworn they were miles of... birds like gargantuan vultures out of some insane nightmare had come on the wings of fury. And now, as they sprang to the defense of their young, they clawed and pecked and screamed. Then, grasping the two men in their mighty talons, they yanked them savagely from the precarious ledge, soared high over the knife-like crag, their enemies dangling like evil puppets. And then, as though by some vengeful signal, they dropped them into the yawning chasm under the piercing rocks. Then they returned to the young, unmindful of the two humans who had witnessed their revenge. Tarzan placed a supporting arm under Kerndon's shoulder and half carried him back along the trail toward the medical help he needed so desperately. Well, Dr. Mortensen... I think your patient is going to recover. I hope so. A man like Kerndon restores one's faith in people. Your assistant, the one who was the last blow to your faith in man, he must have encountered the same fate as Craig and Rossignol. There was a skeleton at the base of the cliff. Yes, yes, I found it first. That's where I got the feather. He also hoped for more profit and fame. Rossignol might have achieved it. For I couldn't have deserted Kerndon to follow him, and had he left after securing the first young bird, perhaps he might have avoided its parents in the dense jungle. It was his decision to get the two in the nest that cost Craig and him their lives. The old saying, Tarzan, a bird in the hand. Tonight's episode of Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, concludes CBS Radio's present cycle of these exciting adventure programs. Now stay tuned for the news, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS Radio stations. Your announcer, Bob Mowen.